and here we are. So we're starting the recording so that we can make a YouTube movie out of it. And as many of you know, then we have a, um, uh, we all, I have a YouTube channel with all the lectures that are recorded and shown there. And uh, you're always welcome to come back to it and, uh, and take a look at some of the videos that we, that we have there. Um, so today we have a very, very special, uh, a very special uh, uh, lecture uh, about the beautiful country of Ethiopia that I visited at the end of 2018. And uh, the week was kind enough to host me in Ethiopia as I was traveling through the, uh, through the country. And uh, uh, I've got to tell you that I decided literally from the minute I landed there that I just have to add Ethiopia to my list of destinations and do my very best to promote this unbelievably beautiful country. Uh, if you saw the video that I was playing until now, um, I found this uh, one video that, that uh, uh, shows Ethiopia from above, mostly the farmlands and the, uh, the countryside. Uh, and you can see what a beautiful green country it is and how much they depend on agriculture, uh, which is why back in the 80s when they went through a period of uh, severe famine for a few years, uh, it, was a, it was a very bad period for, for Ethiopia. And uh, I'm so happy to see that now things are, are much better there as far as, the, uh, as far as the rain and as far as the agriculture. Um, such a beautiful, beautiful country. And Dawit is an expert guide. He's been guiding uh, people in Ethiopia for about 10 years now. And um, is that correct, Dawit, about 10 years? Uh, you need to unmute yourself. There we go. There we go. Okay. So uh, Dawit's okay. been guiding people for, and, and in addition to that, I also wanted to, to show you that uh, uh, Dawit has written a book. Uh, if you can see this, I don't know if it's upside, if it's uh, backwards or not because of the, uh, the yeah, computer right. camera. Oh, it's backwards. So basically, the book is called Visiting Ethiopian Churches, <clears throat> and uh, it's available on Kindle, and I also have a hard copy. If anybody really wants a hard copy, I'll be happy to send it to you. But if you have a Kindle and you're listening right now, you're more than welcome to send me an email, and I'll be happy to send you a free, uh, a free copy via the Kindle, compliments of uh, my little company. Um, and uh, the week, uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start sharing the, uh, the screen, and uh, we can start with the lecture. Let me see here. Uh, and of course, if anybody has any questions during the lecture, feel free to chat them uh, or just unmute yourself for a second, uh, you know, but you can chat them either to me or to the whole group as you wish. And let's, uh, let's go ahead with this, uh, share the screen and Ethiopia. Okay. And uh, Dawit, I'm hoping that uh, uh, I'm hoping that you can begin by telling us um, before before we proceed um, a little bit about why Ethiopia is uh, considered by the locals uh, as the land of origins. Okay, okay. So welcome, everybody. Nice to uh, meet you in this uh, virtual lecture. So uh, yes. Uh, the land of origins is a new motto of the Ethiopian tourism. So why they chose that is because of a number of things, but uh, one of the most important, of course, is uh, paleontology. Uh, so there's a study of like the evolution of uh, humans from people who believe in that. So there are a number of amazing discoveries. Uh, so the most famous one is uh, Lucy, uh, 3.2 million uh, years uh, old fossil discovered in Ethiopia. So, but there were also, there are also others uh, older than Lucy, like 4 million, 5 million uh, hominids, we call them, uh, who are believed uh, uh, to uh, be possibly our ancestors or human ancestors. So, uh, so the story that uh, Ethiopia could be one of the uh, possible origins of human beings. So that's one of them. There are other, another, every, every one of you drink coffee every day. Uh, I think, you know, coffee comes from different parts of the world, but the claim of Ethiopia is that coffee is originated in Ethiopia. Uh, so there is a province known as Kaffa. Uh, so it's a, uh, so we claim the name coffee or caffeine or cafe came from, uh, come from this uh, word, uh, Kaffa. So still they have wild coffee there. They get their coffee. So coffee, uh, Lucy or humans, and then uh, Ethiopia has its unique uh, grains. F, if you didn't know about it, it's very, very tiny, tiny grain. 
So it's uh, first domesticated in Ethiopia. It's gluten-free, it's becoming very famous all over the world now. And then uh, we have also a seed known as Niger seed. It's a yellow flower seed. Uh, most of the people in America, they tell me, they know it as a bird seed uh, mostly, but it's domesticated in Ethiopia. We use it to make oil, to get oil out of it. The other one is insert like a banana-like plant known as false banana. So uh, that's also originated in Ethiopia. And we, uh, on top of that, we can add that the Nile, the Blue Nile especially, which is the most important part of the Nile. By the way, 85% of, uh, of the water of the, the waters of the Nile comes from Ethiopia. So uh, the Blue Nile is originated in Ethiopia in Lake Tana. So all these factors uh, contributed to this uh, designation of Ethiopia as the land of origins. Wonderful. So, uh, Dawit, uh, whenever you need me to move uh, with a slide, uh, just let me know next slide and I'll be happy to go from there, okay? Yeah, so Ophir, the best one is uh, when I move from Aksum Lalibala, like just if you uh, move, it would be nice. So I will concentrate on the talk, yes? Okay, okay, very good. Okay. okay. So, uh, uh, as I said, uh, welcome everybody. That This is a good map, really shows the location of Ethiopia in the Horn of Africa. I think most of you know the Horn of Africa. This is like horn-like uh, shape, which consists of Ethiopia, uh, Somalia, Djibouti, and uh, Eritrea are known as the Horn of Africa. So Ethiopia is surrounded by countries like Eritrea, Djibouti, Somalia on the southeast, and Kenya on the south. Southern Sudan on the west and Northern Sudan or Sudan on the northwest. So it's a mountainous country uh, located in this uh, uh, part of Africa. Large percentage of mountains in Africa above uh, 3,000 meters are concentrated in Ethiopia. It's really a good map. And this map also, you can see the mountains and the major rivers. If you see, if you see, uh, start from the border of Eritrea up there, and uh, uh, up, up here and come down, 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 down here. Uh, this is Lake Tana, this is the source of the Blue Nile. This is just one river in Ethiopia. We have hundreds of rivers from these mountains flowing all the way to the west. And uh, we have mountains, no, no, the eastern mountains on the east here. And then we have what you call the Rift Valley. This is like a valley created by, as a result of tectonic uh, plate uh, movement. So the, for some reason, uh, two plates uh, under Ethiopia moving apart. So as a result, the Rift Valley is forming. It's not only in Ethiopia. It starts all the way from Dead Sea in Israel and continues across the Red Sea, across Ethiopia, especially in this year, and continues all the way to Kenya, Kenya Tanzania. So it's really very, very important, especially nowadays. In nowadays, uh, there's paleontological, uh, the Lucy, this a fossil, 3.2 million year old fossil, uh, has been discovered here. There are a number of uh, other discoveries. So this part of Ethiopia, northeastern part of Ethiopia, is especially really, really important. Not only for, from an uh, Ethiopian perspective, from global perspective, probably this is the origin of uh, 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 our ancestors. So uh, it's really, really an important place. And then uh, fast forward, so Ethiopia is a land of Lucy. That's where Lucy was, Lucy walked uh, three million years ago. Uh, but historically, Ethiopia is very important. For instance, there is very important woman in uh, history, at least, in this part of the world is known as the Queen of Sheba. Uh, this queen probably ruled uh, this north and part of Ethiopia and part of Eritrea and maybe Yemen on the other side. But in the time of King Solomon of Israel, we know where he lived, when he lived. Uh, so she went, uh, she heard about his wisdom, decided to visit this king in uh, Israel. She went all the way with gifts of like gold and ivory and something like that. So she gave him or she presented him with the gifts and really enjoyed that. Uh, so she said she came uh, she's interest was to learn his wisdom or wisdom from him, uh, how to run uh, her country, uh, Ethiopia or the Aksumite kingdom. But Solomon right away seems to have really liked her, uh, wanted to have uh, an affair with her. But she said, no, 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 I'm not interested. Uh, but uh, King Solomon devised a trick, according to this Ethiopian uh, 
uh, legend. So one of the days he prepared very spicy dinner, a spicy dinner. Uh, so as a result, uh, also he made her promise. Okay, I'm not, if you are not interested in me, no problem. You are free, but you have to promise me. Uh, you shouldn't take anything without my permission uh, from my palace. So the, uh, the queen said, okay, so if you do that, I respect. If you don't respect, I may not respect my promise. But uh, that day he prepared very spicy dinner. She had that dinner, they ate dinner, uh, but it was very spicy. He put all the waters in his bedroom. So in the middle of the night, she, this woman really wants to uh, get water and uh, went into his bedroom. So he said, oh, Queen, what you are doing here? You are really uh, breaking your promise. So this time she said, okay, you can do whatever you want. But the same night she got uh, pregnant and she came back and got her baby, uh, whom she called King Solomon. No, sorry, King Minilik. Uh, so Minilik was the first, uh, the, the first uh, uh, king of Ethiopia from King Solomon. So this was the foundation of the Solomonic dynasty. But the story didn't stop there. So after, 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 when he, he became about 20, he was really asking, who is my father? Who is my father? I would like to go and see uh, my father. So, so she allowed him. He went all the way to Israel. So King Solomon really liked him. Oh, why not we, uh, you stay here and be, uh, stay here? But the Ethiopian guy said, no, 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 no. I would like to go back to my mother and to Ethiopia and run the country. Uh, but this time Solomon said, okay, uh, he chose like firstborn sons of his officials, you, 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 accompany my son to Ethiopia. So this guy said, are we going there for good? He said, yes, you have to help my son to run a country there. So they said, oh, if we are doing, going there for good, why not we take the Ark of the Covenant with us? So they went to the temple, so they stole the Ark of the Covenant, so they brought uh, it to Ethiopia, neither telling to Solomon to, or to Minilik, the Ethiopian guy. So they brought it to Ethiopia. So we believe the Ark of the Covenant is still in Ethiopia. If you have questions later on, maybe in the future, when you come to Ethiopia, we can talk a lot about it. There are so many movies, documentaries, books about it, uh, but um, it is believed still it's in Aksum. Later on, uh, we will see the chapel of the Ark of the Covenant in one of the photos, but now I will move to, uh, to the origin of the introduction of Christianity in the fourth uh, century in the period of a king known as Izana, uh, Christianity was introduced to Ethiopia. By that time in Ethiopia, uh, there was uh, this kingdom known as the Aksumite kingdom, which consisted of Aksum, you see this town here, and parts of Eritrea, Adolis was their port on the Red Sea, and this northern part of Ethiopia, there were times when the Aksumites uh, conquered Yemen at different times. That's really uh, very well recorded in history. So this kingdom was really very powerful. So why? Uh, so there are a number of factors. For instance, a Roman writer mentioned that, oh, Aksum was one of the greatest empires in the, uh, in the world, along with Rome, along with Persia. So it's really amazing. So what are the signs of its greatness? One, its territorial extent. So Aksum was really a very large empire. And then also its economic activities. That's really interesting because the Aksumites traded with the Indians, traded with the Persians, traded with the Romans using gold coins and silver coins with the names of the king on them. And so that really shows you this was really a full-fledged strong kingdom uh, for a civilization to mint coins from gold and silver. It really shows you uh, the economy is doing well. It was very organized a stratified uh, community or society because you have you need to have the workers, the artisans, the blacksmiths and the farmers to feed all these people, the managers and the record keepers. So it really shows so many things. Uh, among them, for instance, the king named Izana in the fourth uh, century had coins with the sun and the moon uh, initially. Then he started to mint coins with uh, the crops. So historians said, uh, found out that uh, with the help of other sources too, yes, Izana was the first king who became uh, Christian. That was in the fourth century. Other greatness of the Aksumites, uh, the great, uh, signs of greatness of the Aksumites uh, was their uh, monuments they left behind us. So we went to, with Ophir to Aksum, we saw ruins of palaces. Some of them are known as the Queen of Sheba. 
uh, reons of temples and like that, but also there are amazing monuments of uh, uh, burial monuments. This uh, Aksumite buried their dead in uh, big, big, very large tombs with number of rooms. And on top of that, they erected. So if you go to the next photo, I think we will see maybe uh, this. Ah, so that's let's see. So continue with there. Uh, so uh, so the Aksumites uh, left monuments or a burial monument. This ones we call them the Stele of Aksum. So in this photo, it may not be clear, but the one standing in the center, the tallest one. Uh, is like 25 meters, we call it the Rome Stele, and the one on the right, uh, standing with their uh, support, is 21 meters, uh, so that we call that the, the, the standing Stele. The one in the uh, foreground, which is uh, broken and shattered, uh, that was originally measured 33 meters and weighed 520 tons. Now, that's really amazing. This was made from a single piece of rock. And uh, then all these things were erected on tops of the tombs of the Aksumite kings. So now this uh, the shattered one. It's believed it fell and uh, broken when they were trying to erect it uh, in, the, uh, in the, at the beginning of the fourth century. So why? There are a number of theories, maybe the base. The base is the one on the left end, uh, was too short, uh, but uh, it is, the large, it was the largest single piece of rock ever carved by a human being. So you have rocks in Eastern Islands, you have rocks in Egypt, you have rocks in other parts of the world, but none of them are close in size with this. So again, to give you the context, the standing stele, the Rome stele, the one Cluid standing, the tallest one is 170 ton. The standing stele on the other end, it's 160 ton. Even in nowadays, there are not cranes which could lift this amount of rock. So imagine lifting 520 tons. So it's still a puzzle. So we take uh, people there. So they ask us, how did they transport it? So there are speculations. Maybe they use like timber and water or other things, but none of them are um, founded on the information from that time. So as I said, the largest a piece of stone carved uh, by human being is in, located in Ethiopia. Now the Aksumite kingdom, so doing all these amazing things, survived uh, all the way from the uh, first to the 10th century. It was a very strong kingdom, but around the 10th century started to de decline. One of the reasons maybe for the decline was said to be like the rise of Islam. Uh, by the way, if you didn't know, uh, Ethiopia or the Aksumite kingdom really played very, very important role in the early days of Islam, supporting the Prophet Muhammad when his uh, followers were persecuted. They came to Ethiopia and uh, they came to Ethiopia uh, as, a re as a refuge. And uh, then those people were after them, uh, were asking for their hand, but the Ethiopian king said, no, 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 they, should, they could stay in Ethiopia as long as they want, as long as they want. So they lived in Ethiopia. These are like the future wives of Muhammad, even the one of the daughters of Muhammad, Rukia, was in Ethiopia. And then later on, they returned, of course, the Prophet Muhammad managed to really establish himself. And then finally, when he was on his death, never declared jihad on Ethiopia. So Ethiopia was exempted from jihad. But of course, after the uh, days of the Prophet Muhammad, there was division among the Muslim uh, uh, rulers. So some of them are really created problem for the Aksumite kingdom. So by the 10th century, it was very difficult for the Aksumite kingdom to communicate with the outside world uh, as they used to do. Uh, so, uh, so, so they became inward looking kingdom. So they retreated southwardless. So that's how a new capital city named Lalibela uh, emerged in their, in their 12th century. So between the 10th and uh, 12th century, it was a period of decline. So sometimes historians call it, this is a dark age. For instance, Edward Gibbon, the British writer, said something like this, Ethiopia slept for thousands of, uh, thousands of years, forgotten by the world, by uh, forgetting the world by whom they were forgotten. So, but anyway, in the 12th century, a new capital city would come at Lalibela. Lalibela is really very important in Ethiopian history. Uh, it's a new capital with a new dynasty. So 
as we said, because of this King Solomon connection, so the Ethiopian dynasty is known as the Solomonic dynasty, but after the 10th century, maybe it also lost power. So a new dynasty known as the Zagwe dynasty began to rule in Lalibela. So, uh, okay, so this is one of the photos, really shows the temple of the Ark of the Covenant. So the chapel on the right side with the dome on the right side, that's where if there is the Ark of the Covenant anywhere in the world, it is located here. So uh, there, as I said, there are a number of theories about it. There's a monk who is a guardian. Nobody is allowed to go in there, but this monk uh, goes in and comes out and clean and keep it, guard it. So you can see the barbed wire because once a tourist, they say maybe about 10 years ago, tried to, uh, tried to take his chance by climbing over the fence when they stopped him. So as a precaution after that, they put uh, this barbed wire so that's one of the attractions of Aksum in nowadays. So we go very close to it. So in Lalibela, as I said, uh, so this is the church of Aksum uh, built by Hel Selassie, uh, relatively modern, but there is an older church also in the same compound. Okay, so this is Lalibela. So this is a new cup in the 12th century, in the 13th century, to the capital city of Ethiopia. There was there are a new dynasty, there are a number of uh, uh, kings in this dynasty, but the number one or the most famous one is King Lalibela. So he ruled at the end of the 12th century and then he carved churches out of rock from solid rock. So this is just, you see one part of the church known as Beta Marem from the 12th century, but it's not one church or two churches he carved. It was like 11 churches out of rock so why, you may ask, uh, he really uh, took all this trouble to uh, car carve churches out of rock. Uh, so it seems he was inspired, he said, by God. God told him to create the second Jerusalem in Ethiopia. Uh, so uh, because it seems in the 12th century, Ethiopian Christians had really hard time uh, traveling all the way from Ethiopia uh, to Israel across Sudan and Egypt. So after the rise of Islam, that became really not easy. So King Lalibela seems to have really inspired to create a church out of rock. These are not the first churches out of rock. Later on, we will see the Tigray churches. Uh, so what you see now, these are the churches under shelter. By the way, they are below the ground level. So this is like a volcanic. So we'll see especially the most famous one, St. George. So, uh, they are really this one. Yes, we have to we have to talk a little bit more about this one. So in every website, maybe if you see check Ophiris website, everybody's website uh, in Ethiopia about tourism and even about everything, you see this uh, this uh, church. Uh, probably this is one of the most famous sites. There is a book known as uh, uh, Forty Places in the World You Should Visit. You need visit before you die. So one of them is Lalibela. So forty. So is Taj Mahal, the Parthenon, something like that. So it's really, really. So imagine carving this church out of a single rock. You can clearly see. Uh, so uh, there's like this area, it's like carved out. So you have the center, it is there, uh, the church. Even they bothered about the drainage because at this side, at this side and at the other end, there's a small spout carved from the single, uh, from the same rock. So it's what's amazing about this church. It survived all these 800 years while the other churches uh, needed really shelter and whatever, but this church is really still in a good condition. Uh, so I go to this church, I take people to this church many times a year. I, I think this is one of the reasons. Probably if uh, I take people after 10 years, 20 years, this is one of the reasons because I still puzzle, it's still really puzzling how people manage to do that. Did they have really a program, <laughs> computer program? They didn't. So how could they carve like such a perfect architectural, architecturally perfect church from a single rock 800 years ago? It's really, really, really amazing. So people in Ethiopia, whether they come to visit Ethiopia, whether they come for conference, by the way, uh, this Ababa in Ethiopia is known as the Brussels of Africa. It is the center of African Union. So we get so many travelers uh, conference, uh, business uh, people. So when they come, if they ask us, oh, uh, I have to, uh, one day spare, two days spare, so to spare, so uh, where should I go? Oh, we say, 
even we don't think twice, go to Lalibela. I know people, tour companies who run birding tours or trekking in other parts of Ethiopia. So they, everybody says, but you have to include at least Lalibela. Even if you are not interested in Aksum and in Gondor, in other places, you have to include Lalibela. So Lalibela is really, really important. You know, this is uh, uh, sometimes it's known, known as also the eighth wonder of the world. Now, that's really interesting, you know, this is uh, an official list of the seventh wonder of the world. So uh, many Ethiopians are claiming Lalibela should be the eighth wonder. So all these churches, this is one of the 11 churches, they should be called the eighth wonder of the world. Now, uh, these are 11 churches covered in 24 years time using like chisels and hammers. In some of the churches you see all these uh, markers. So anyway, anyway, so Lalibela is really, really very important in Ethiopian history and in Ethiopian tourism. Now we move to Tigray the, to see the Tigray rock churches. Now, many people come to Ethiopia and visit the uh, Lalibela churches because they are famous, they are so refined, they are standing there, but the Tigray rock churches, so believe it or not, there are churches carved out of rock. In this rock, uh, one of the churches here, uh, of here, can you see my cursor? Okay, so anyway, uh, there's a church here. To reach there, uh, the climb is on the other side. So you have really to climb on the face of rock if you go on YouTube and uh, search for Abuna Yimata, Y-I-M-A-T-A. You really see how to climb to that church. So uh, uh, there's a church here. This is one of the hundred rock churches. So it's really amazing how human beings, like in the 12th, 13th, 14th century, managed to go up there, first of all, cover the church out of rock. So there are a number of churches. So what is the difference between the Tigran rock churches and the Lalibela rock churches? The Lalibela rock churches are relatively more accessible. So you can't go there. Uh, so walking through the trenches, it's possible to visit a couple of them in the morning, a couple of them in the afternoon. But for the Tigray rock churches, you have to assign at least uh, a morning for one or two churches, hiking and climbing for an about an hour and two and uh, and the climbing for an hour and the two this is another church this is a man from i think he's from new york a doctor from new york so i took i took him to uh, one of the ch the churches tigray churches so he's getting help uh, so the local people they don't need any help they just use a rope and climb up there so that's really really uh, interesting but of course physical fitness is one of the requirements. So in the next pictures you see, now this monk, this is a church known as Abu Daniel uh, from, the, from the 14th century. Uh, this is a monk, spent all his lifetime, like 65 years up there in the monastery. He never uh, got down to meet other people, only people uh, come up to visit him. So this beautifully painted church. So this is how the monk is also dressed in Ethiopia, by the way. This is one of the most amazing church. I took their uh, British uh, family. So one of the women said, this is really, really tough. But anyway, what's amazing about the, the Tigray rock churches, you go up there, you climb, you go up there, you climb, and you see a very simple rock. But when the priest opens the church, you see something like this. So that's uh, what I felt first time. So I didn't expect like inside the church would be like this, architecturally fascinating with paintings from all the times. So these are like a coppola. I think these are the apostles with incense burners around there. Uh, so this is one of the churches known as Abuna uh, Mikhail. And in nowadays, by the way, people also try to reach them with helicopters, but I think that's not a fun. Uh, the Tigray churches would be really fun if you climb. Sometimes you may uh, come across uh, the chanting. So the Ethiopian ch uh, uh, church chanting is compared with the biblical chant of King David. You remember the King David when he was transporting the Ark of the Covenant, he was like singing and dancing, they say. So everybody was critical of that. How could the king do that? But he said, oh, I'm respecting, honoring the Ark of the Covenant. So many travelers in the past, like missionaries, when they came to Ethiopia and see the Ethiopian church uh, priests like singing and dancing, literally like jumping and dancing with the drum, with this big drum, they were surprised, but that's like part of the old tradition. So by the way, the Christianity in Ethiopia is one of the oldest. Christianity came to Ethiopia 
uh, only uh, accepted as a state religion only after Armenia. So Ethiopia is the second oldest Christian nation. Even in this picture, I can't talk for about an hour about the drum, the origin of the drum and what is that, but just try to note uh, something like this is a drum. And in, this guy has what he calls the sistra. So it's like rattle. Uh, when they sing, uh, it has beautiful uh, sound, rattling sound. And they have found out that this musical instrument was found ancient Egyptian tombs, really showing you that this instrument was pre-Christian, but adopted or um, uh, adapted by Christianity. See the crosses, Ethiopia is one of the countries where the cross really evolved. Tigray ha has also other fascinating sites, archaeological sites, and this altar is like 2,700 years old, and the writing is known as Sabian writing. By the way, it has its own uh, alphabet. Uh, Ethiopia has never been colonized. This is one of the things that really makes Ethiopia. So it has own also its calendar, its alphabet. Sorry if I confuse you. In Ethiopia, this now, at the moment, it's 2012. So uh, we always say travel to Ethiopia and be eight years younger. So uh, that makes also it has its own alphabet. It's also its written language. So this is an altar discovered in Tigray. So this is one of the fascinating things of uh, Tigray. Uh, I think one of the most uh, precious uh, discoveries in Ethiopia. Now we move to Gondor. So south of Aksum and Tigray is Gondor. Uh, in Gondor, uh, with the capital city of Ethiopia, in their uh, 16th and uh, uh, in their 17th and 18th century. Uh, so it's known for its castles. So that's really amazing because when you see these castles, everybody who comes to Ethiopia, not only now, in the past, they say, oh, it, it looks like a castle from Spain or Portugal. Yes, it has interesting connection with that. In their, in their uh, 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 16th century, there was Muslim Christian conflict in Ethiopia. The Christians really lost very badly. And then they asked for assistance from their Portuguese. So 400 Portuguese, Portuguese soldiers came uh, led by Cristóvão da Gama, the son of Vasco da Gama, and they helped the Ethiopians to defeat the Muslims. The Muslims were also getting assistance by the Ottoman Turks, by the way. So anyway, uh, they stayed on. So they uh, start to assist building like uh, churches and castles and like that. So this is from that period. So many travelers, when we take them to Gondor, say, I didn't expect castles in Africa uh, like this. So it's not one castle, it's not two. There are more than five of them. So it's like this is generations of kings building. So this one is the first one may, built by a king named Fas, by Fasiladus in uh, 1640. Uh, the castles are made basically out of basalt, lime, uh, as a mortar, and timber. So what's amazing, they are still there. So there are many of them behind uh, them. So Gondor is really also known, uh, there are a number of castles, they are also known for their churches, there are a number of churches in Gondor, uh, but the most fascinating church in Gondor is the one with uh, winged uh, heads of angels. We will see the picture after a while, I think. So, uh, uh, so uh, Gondor remains the capital city of Ethiopia in the 17th and 18th century. And uh, so it's uh, the center of religion, the center of uh, learning uh, and uh, architecture and art. Uh, so uh, especially kings named Fasiladas, king named Johannes, person. Yes, this is also one of the castles of Gondor with a pool, uh, no water in there. Uh, but once a year for Temkat, this is a baptism of Christ, uh, they fill and they fill uh, this pool with water. So uh, in Janu on January 19th, that's one of the areas really, we get so many travelers to Ethiopia. So this built in the 17th century by uh, Fasiladus. Uh, he was a founder of Gondor, as I said. There was also a king named Johannes, very righteous person, even really took care of animals. Uh, so some people say he was really uh, interested in uh, the safety and care of animals. Uh, so, as I said, this is from the period of Fasiladas. And uh, yes, this is uh, the uh, picture from the Church of Gondor. And uh, this is, some people call this church 
the Sestian Chapel of Ethiopia, because this is a painting on the ceiling, by the way. So these are angels, uh, winged heads of angels. Uh, so they really fill the ceiling from one end to the other. And this is one of the most recognizable uh, picture from Ethiopia. On the wall, there are a number of other biblical scenes. When the people paint this, they used local color like ochre, uh, black, for instance, was like soot, red ochre, and minam, and, or, 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 and different minerals were used. Uh, so this is one of the churches in Gondar. But in Ethiopia, we have hundreds and hundreds of uh, churches. Now, if you drive just five kilometers out of Gondar, uh, you'll suddenly be in the land of uh, the former Ethiopian Jews village known as Waleka. So that's really interesting. So Jews in Ethiopia, I think most of you know that, but we have so many Jews in Ethiopia historically. The origins, uh, the, the origin is diverse. The story is diverse. So I'll say a few more things about it. So uh, one of the theories says they came with the uh, son of the Queen of Sheba, Minilik, so because King Solomon ordered him, them to accompany him. So they came through Sudan, Egypt, Sudan, and settled in northern part of Ethiopia. But historically, it's very well recorded. They have really very large kingdom, um, really ruling uh, their kingdom by their own administering. But with the expansion of Christianity, conflict developed. So their number dwindled because they were forcefully converted to Christianity. Then fast forward with the rise of Israel as a state, uh, in 1948, in the Israeli constitution, there is a right of return to their homeland. So some people, activists, start to take this seriously to help these people, especially in 1985. Ophir was uh, talking about there was famine in Ethiopia. Yes, in 1985, uh, I was a child. I remember I had a life, with, a life with witness. Uh, it was caused by drought. And the drought really created a lot so many problems because it's an agricultural country. These people were affected like other people, the Ethiopian Jews. So these activists encouraged them to go to, uh, to the Sudan. If they go to the Sudan, they would help them to airlift. I think uh, you heard about, uh, actually about this airlift of uh, Ethiopian Jews uh, from uh, Israel. What was, what was the name of the, that movie? Of oh, here. And, uh, Red it's called uh, it's called the Red Sea uh, Diving Red sea, Red sea Diving Resort. Yes, Red Sea Diving Red Resort. Red Sea Diving Resort. I think that's really interesting movie. My only um, my only regret with that probably if they if they put Ethiopian characters in that would have been nice. But anyway, so that movie is really really tells all the story. It's really amazing uh, project of uh, uh, encouraging these people to flock all the way from the Ethiopian mountains down into the. Uh, Sudan is desert and lowlanders, and then they would uh, take them and they put them in the airplane. Even we were told they removed seats from the airplane to accom ac accommodate so many people, and they flew them to Israel. So imagine people from the third world in Ethiopia moving to Israel, uh, the shock and the, uh, their surprise. So anyway, so they live there. So we have probably, I think it's growing every time, but last time I checked, maybe about 150,000 Ethiopian Jews in Israel. Most of them are integrating very well, but others, I think there's a little bit of problem. You may read about that. But anyway, this village, the Ethiopian Jews village, we saw now there are no Jews. Most of the Jews have left. Uh, it's uh, taken by Christian community. But amazingly, that uh, synagogue we saw, it's taken care of by a Christian family because there's, uh, people are interested and come and visit. It. Okay, now we move to Lake Tana. Uh, we call it a heart-shaped lake. Even it's heart-shaped and this picture shows. So it's the largest lake in Ethiopia, Highland Lake. Again, when we take people, people really get surprised. This lake is like a sea, uh, 3,600 square kilometer. And it's known as the source of the Blue Nile. So the Blue Nile starts somewhere here and goes like this to the Sudan and then uh, to Egypt. And a source of the Blue Nile, uh, it's the bird life is really amazing. Even we have hippos in Lake Tana. Uh, so naturally, it's right. even uh, with the help of now UNESCO, they are setting up the Lake Tana Biosphere Reserve because it's so diverse, especially the fish in Lake Tana is unique. Uh, there are different uh, unique uh, species of fish because 
it's uh, uh, separated from the Mediterranean or any water uh, out of the lake by the uh, falls or the cataracts of the Nile. So anyway, this is very important. Historically, it's very important. We, this is a boat trip on Lake Tana to see some of the most fascinating churches in the lake, uh, known for their paintings uh, uh, from early period. So historical uh, sources or traditions say that Christianity was in, uh, introduced to this part of Ethiopia from Aksum Lalibela in the 14th century. They still use papyrus boats to transport themselves, to transport as a transport from one uh, island to another, to the shore. These papyrus boats, by the way, are also found uh, in uh, carvings in uh, Egyptian tombs, really showing you this is an old tradition. And people have been to Tik, Titi, Titicaca, Lake Titicaca. They uh, also see very similar papyrus boats with a very shared culture. So people is the fish, the natural vegetation is still there. Uh, coffee in some of these forests, they grow coffee. So it's really interesting, uh, lake from nature and culture perspective. So as I said, Christianity was introduced and we see churches like this on the lake. So in the 14th century, a king named Amdazion came to Lake Tana and founded a church. So circular churches, as far as I know, are unique to Ethiopia. Until the 14th, 15th century, they were not. This is like part of my research. So this is one of the churches actually uh, taken care of in my book. Uh, so they start to build circular churches. Why? So one tradition says maybe they are influence of this Jewish uh, synagogue. Other tradition says, no, 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 no. After the uh, conflict with the Muslims, uh, lost the Christian Ethiopians lost so many of their churches. So they start to build patched churches, which really looks like the Ethiopian huts. So anyway, from the outside, yes, it's nice looking, but the surprise is when you go inside. So when you move inside, you see those paintings. So this is one of the churches I'm really interested. So these are the story of the, uh, the birth of Christ, the flagellation of Christ, the crucifixion, and so on. So it's so detailed. So my assumption is that in the past, when people were illiterate, uh, these churches were really the place where people really got their biblical lessons because in Europe we have what we call uh, what we call poor man's Bibles. The painting served as a poor man's Bible, so people uh, really learned a lot from the paintings and makes them beautiful. We can talk uh, about these uh, uh, paintings when I take people to this church. This is a story of the cannibal, how he became cannibal, and he was saved with the help of the Virgin Mary. So it's really really interesting story. So it's a really detailed story in the church paintings. Okay, so now we move to Southern Ethiopia. So I just wanted to highlight uh, Northern, uh, the Omo Valley, but otherwise Ethiopia is so diverse. So if you didn't know, by the way, we have 80, 80 ethnic groups in this country. So we speak a language known as Amharic, largely, but there are 80 groups some of them are very small. There are people known as the Karo or Kara in Southern Ethiopia. They are just only 1,000. These are the Hammer people. They are maybe about 50,000. So they are a small number. So it's so diverse. Nobody knows why this southwestern corner of Ethiopia is so diverse because there are different theories. For instance, in Papua New Guinea, uh, because of its mountainous, uh, there are so many diversities because people couldn't communicate easily. But the Omo Valley is not. Like that, it's relatively flat. But anyway, one of the assumptions is that it was a crossroad of people, like people moving from the Sudan, from Kenya to Ethiopia, from Ethiopian islands to the south. So uh, really, really interesting. So about the previous picture, I will talk uh, more. Uh, so uh, the body painting is very important, but this is really, really one of the most important, fascinating cultures of the Omo Valley. The hammer, cattle, jumping, uh, rite of passage. So a hammer boy, when he's ready to get married, or when he uh, is ready to pass from boyhood to adulthood, uh, he has to prepare, or his parents have to prepare a big banquet and gathering, and uh, people eat and drink and like that. But the climax of all these events, the rite of passage is this boy run or jump over uh, cattle. So they bring like bulls and uh, together, so this guy starts from one inch, uh, naked, fully naked, 
and runs on the rest of the cattle and jumps on the ground on this inch and runs from this side and uh, on to the other side. So this is really, really fascinating. Very few people, there are another group known as the Benna and the Karo do that. But for the Hammer, whoever he is, if he is like an Ethiopian from Highland part of Ethiopia, very rich, very wealthy, wants to get uh, married a Hammer woman, they're one of their girls, they ask him, have you done your cattle jumping? So if you say no, so you are not a man. So why, how do you ask like about the hand of our girl? So anyway, so, uh, so this is one of the most important fascinating culture. Body painting is an important cultural aspect. Of this is one of our visits. We go to the village, they had this gathering. Uh, this is after the harvest season. So they paint their body. The assumption is that to imitate like birds. We have birds known as guinea fowls uh, with spots black and white so on the black skin when you put uh, the white uh, chalk really uh, uh, creates uh, contrast so this is uh, one of the dancing traditions of uh, the hammer people in the omo valley this is a closer look on even on the faces say to the dots maybe this one really even closer to leopard or so but there is uh, in the past by the way this area was like full of wild animals like elephants and buffaloes and giraffes and leopards and like that. These people really lived with these animals, so it's not surprising if they get influenced by uh, these uh, animals. Okay, we visit also camel uh, markets. One well, of the reasons we include you, I just like, it's take it easy. So you go to the market and you see interesting things. People even be interested. Some of the children uh, may be interested in the travelers. So it's very smooth interaction even if it's really very remote, very underdeveloped uh, part of Ethiopia. Uh, okay, one of the most fascinating uh, cultures of the Omo Valley is lip plate tradition. So these are the people on the Morsi. So a Morsi girl at puberty uh, pierce her lower lip or cut a little bit of her lower lip, and then she put a stock in the wood and gradually she expands and then expands and expands. And finally, she put a pulley like plates made out of clay uh, into her lip. For them, it's a beauty. For most outsiders, of course, uh, from other parts of Ethiopia and other parts of the world, it's not beautiful. But when we travel to the Omo Valley, that's what I encourage uh, travelers. Really st stop judging and try to understand their culture. So for them, it's beautiful. For instance, a hammer, a Muslim man uh, to, to uh, find or uh, to get married, he has to pay 38 cows to get a wife. So if uh, she has a lip plate, he really likes it. If she doesn't have a lip plate, uh, she doesn't have a lip plate, he may not be interested in her. So for the Mursi, it's uh, 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 so this older woman, right side, she has also. Uh, cut a lip, but don't wear it. So they, sometimes they may not wear it. Uh, so the, this is another uh, picture from the Omo Valley, the Hammer people. Now, just when you look at this woman, uh, the hairstyle really looks modern, but the hair is made out of, uh, or the decoration of the makeup is made out of ochre, like earth and butter and a little bit of incense. Really. That's their culture. Now, what is on her neck is also interesting. So this projected ring uh, on her neck really shows that this woman is the first wife of the Hammer man. So even you can tell. So culturally, who is the first wife, who is the second wife, is uh, so really, really very fascinating and complex culture. Uh, so uh, nowadays, there's more access, more roads are being built. Ethiopian government's building a lot of roads. So it's more becoming more accessible. This guy is now sleeping on headrest. Uh, that's one of the mark of a man in the Omo Valley. Uh, so it's not comfortable to us. Uh, it doesn't look comfortable. Uh, but for the uh, Hammer people, the Kara people in the Omo Valley, they could sleep. They sleep actually the whole night. Once I, I tried, as part of my research, I stayed in a village. I tried to sleep on that. It was a, a second nature when somebody managed to sleep the whole night on this. Um, okay, so uh, we move 
uh, to uh, other parts of Ethiopia, so landscapes. So uh, this is part of the Ethiopian landscapes. This is the Earth Alley volcano. Uh, so in northeastern part of Ethiopia, uh, at night you can see the colors and the lights, the fire. Uh, but this is a picture taken on the, during the day. And also we have, uh, this is, uh, we have, this is one of the lost places on earth, as I said, uh, Dalur in northeastern part of Ethiopia, one of the lost places uh, on earth. You may contradict me, but this is also one of, I don't know, the hottest place on earth for a long period of time, like 50 degrees centigrade for a long period of time, especially in uh, the summer season and after. So, uh, but there are geysers, it looks like hot springs uh, driving out and their salt and other minerals create amazing colors. Everybody would take their say, oh, this is really like from another planet, below sea level, this kind of color, another flight nearby, there are salt mines, uh, the Ethiopians have been mining salt for a thousand years. years. Uh, so uh, that's becoming really one of the places people really flock in great numbers. And also we have the Simen Mountains in, uh, uh, in a, a bit uh, south and a bit north from here. This off here uh, in the Simen Mountains during his uh, uh, 2018 visit. So uh, you see there's a background like, like endless. So um, uh, sometimes I read in the past uh, the Simen Mountains being said, the Grand Canyon of Ethiopia. So, because I didn't know, I haven't been to America yet, uh, so I didn't see, I didn't know, uh, experience uh, uh, Grand Canyon. I didn't uh, uh, say that. But many travelers, after seeing then, when I take them there, they say, oh, this is just like the Grand Canyon. But even, they say even wider, that, so it just goes as far as the eye can see. There were volcanoes. So the result of volcanic activity and erosion and glaciation created this fascinating. Now I'd like to say in uh, October uh, 2019, I took an American uh, travel man. He said, it's big travel company. I don't mention the name, but big travel company owner. He traveled all over the world. He said 17 million uh, uh, miles, but he has never seen a landscape like this. So when after I heard after the, uh, uh, about that, I said, I felt we really need to promote these mountains a lot. Yeah, there's a lot of trekking going on for people really fit, like five days, uh, uh, seven days, 10 days to the highest peak, like 15,000 feet above sea level. And so that's right. Okay, now Ethiopia is also the land of nature. We have unique wildlife in Ethiopia. This one is Colobus monkey, common in Ethiopia and in other parts of Africa. But Ethiopia, we have a unique wildlife. So the next picture shows you the Ethiopian wolves, the Jalada and others. They're only uh, found in Ethiopia. This is the Ethiopian wolf. So if you haven't heard before, this is the rarest canide in the world. Canide is a dog family. So there are only about 400 of them. Um, half of them in the Bali mountains in the east, some of them in the Simen mountains. So in the past, we used to call it fox, Ethiopian fox or semen fox, but DNA research uh, showed that it's a wolf related with the coyote in America and the gray wolf in Europe probably arrived in Ethiopia during the ice age, uh, like 100,000 year ago, years ago. So uh, then stuck in the Ethiopian mountains. It feeds on rats, especially there is a mole rat known as giant mole rat. So it feeds on that. So unfortunately, there is a very serious problem uh, because uh, disease from dogs from the surrounding areas, like distemper disease and others, is a problem. Even uh, there is a problem of like uh, dogs breeding with dogs and something like that. So the conservation uh, about it, and also we have this Niala. I think uh, uh, people who have been to other parts of Africa, like Kenya and others, you have seen kudu, this big you know, horned animal, but this is mountain kudu. So it's in the mountains. It's a special species only found in Ethiopia. So we have, uh, uh, see, see the vegetation also lives in the mountains, in the hygienia or juniper forest. So it's really, really, really interesting, uh, unique animal. Uh, this one, uh, actually this is 
my own amateurish picture of uh, the, the Walia ibex uh, and the gelada. So it's really amazing to see two unique animals only found in Ethiopia, just in one photo. So the Walia ibex actually is even more uh, uh, unique because it's only found in the Simen Mountains. In the past, maybe it lived. So there are ibexes in Asia and in Africa and in the Atlas in other parts of the world. But this one is Walia ibex, only found in Ethiopia, found in the Simen Mountains. So for people really interested in wildlife, we say, okay, come to Ethiopia, but come for the unique wildlife. So you uh, cannot see these things anywhere out of Ethiopia. This really wants to show uh, the gelada, not only the gelada, how people could go close. Those people, if they like, actually, could walk in the middle of them. These are, I think, very intelligent animals. They have no problem with humans, especially with tourists, we say, uh, because there is no conflict of interest with the tourists, so you can walk in the middle of them, but they are still wild. There are hundreds of them. There are a number of doc documentaries. If you go and check after this talk, the gelada, uh, G-E-L-A-D-A, uh, baboons, they call them, but now uh, they are saying, the scientists are saying, we should call them monkeys, the gelada monkeys, a unique species of monkeys found only in Ethiopia, in numbers, in great numbers. So you can see like how Ophir managed to go very close uh, to them. So uh, having said that, so finally, I, ask, uh, I really like to address, yes, please hold that photo there because this is one of my favorite photo, probably never take photo like this again. This is an American family from New York. The man on the right actually, is he was in the New York State Exchange, uh, Stock Exchange. So this family came uh, about a year and a half ago to Ethiopia. So they wanted to see every part of Ethiopia. So it's really fast paced trip. We went to the uh, Danakal Depression. This is Dalo, the lost place in Ethiopia. So I wanted to do something interesting. So I took my book, my geology book, this uh, girl, Caroline, the youngest in the family. This is a family with four daughters, one, two, three, four. So anyway, I, uh, so everybody asks us why Dalon gets this color. So I said, okay, I will give this book. So Caroline read this chapter, uh, this, uh, sorry, this uh, paragraph from this book. So she read the bo a book about the lost place on earth, standing on the lost place on earth. So that's really, really interesting experience. I think she will really uh, will not for, uh, for she will never never forget this experience. So that uh, paragraph really explains how this color came. So that's really so. So people travel to Ethiopia. Americans travel to Ethiopia. If you didn't know, Americans are actually number one tourist tourist generating country for Ethiopia. It's a big country. You have I think 300 million or a little bit more people. So many Americans come. Many Europeans come now. Is there the tourist infrastructure? infrastructure? Yes, Ethiopia is undeniable. Uh, it's a poor country affected by drought and like that, but you have markets like this. People are really very friendly. Uh, they, uh, you can meet people in the market. You can meet people on the road in the next pictures. You can see people meeting in the road. Uh, now, this is like one of the days when driving in the Simi Mountain, actually, it, it, this was in September, like to, to 2019. It's a British couple. I was taking them to the Simi Mountain. So uh, uh, we stopped on the road. So people were fascinating. So it's really, even if they speak, they didn't speak English, the local people communicated. So it's like an amateur photo of a road stop. And this is a family, I think, in Lalibela. I and Ophir uh, went to visit. This is uh, Gerard uh, with his daughters, beautiful daughters. I think some of the most beautiful daughters, uh, children children we have in Lalibela. So when we travel in Ethiopia, uh, everybody says, yeah, people are fr really friendly. Uh, so you we visit markets, families, and like that, attend coffee ceremonies and other uh, activities. Yeah, this is part of the coffee ceremony. It became very much associated with Ethiopia. It became like the uh, showing point of Ethiopian hospitality. So uh, you have coffee with families and like that. So. The tourist infrastructure, the last thing we wanted to touch, there is beautiful lodge uh, in uh, Tigray, in uh, Tigray Churches area known as Korkor. So this is at the end of our two stay, days, uh, days stay in October. We had like, there's a group, an American group, fire. Later on, even there was some dancing, the local 
people were dancing around the fire. So it's really very, very good standard lodge, new lodge, the food and everything were there. So people really, if you are interested to travel to Ethiopia, so really feel free. Already there are hundreds, uh, thousands of Americans have already been there. So uh, already uh, the infrastructure is ready for uh, Western travelers. Uh, yeah, but in spite of that, still we need to work on the roads. We need, still we need to build more better lodges. This is another lodge. Uh, so last a um, uh, uh, few months ago, somebody asked me which is the best lodge in Ethiopia. I said, well, the Malimo Lodge in the Simen Mountains. So this is the lodge up there in the mountains. Uh, this is a group in October uh, enjoying themselves in there. You see the fireplace and everything. So, so we added these photos just to show that we have really uh, the infrastructure. Okay, so I really thank you uh, for, for attending uh, my talk. Thank you very, thank you very much, Dawit, uh, for, for, this wonderful, uh, um, for this wonderful lecture. This uh, uh, picture right now, by the way, that everybody is looking at, is uh, is uh, from the Maribela Lodge in uh, La Libela. Um, <clears throat> if you remember, uh, we went there for a visit. This is a picture from the room uh, mm -hmm. that you have from the from the uh, from the balcony, the, from the terrace, little terrace that each room has. And I just wanted to tell everybody that uh, uh, Ethiopian Airlines, you know, I've decided to um, to uh, promote uh, Ethiopia. One of the reasons uh, is that they have. Uh, flights uh, from the United States, um, from Chicago, from New York, from Washington, and perhaps from other places. It's interesting that they also have, by the way, uh, crews that are completely female. Uh, it's very interesting. They have entire female crews on some of the flights, and I think they do that uh, out of the U.S. as well. And we can see here in this, uh, uh, in this photo, we can see a uh, uh, Ethiopian Airlines 787, which is what they have serving outside from the U.S. to uh, Addis Ababa. And uh, uh, inside of Europe, uh, inside of uh, Ethiopia, I'm sorry, inside of Ethiopia, since uh, the roads uh, sometimes are not very good for long distance travel, what we do is we travel by flights. Uh, these are all done with, uh, with these uh, types of uh, Dash 8 uh, Q400 or whatever it's called uh, aircraft, which are uh, just like the regular uh, flights. And uh, uh, these planes take us. So I wanted to go back to the uh, to the very beginning of the uh, the slideshow uh, to show you a map of basically how an itinerary would look like. I wonder if there's a way for me to go back to the beginning. I'm not exactly sure how there's a way to do that. Uh, but basically, if we look at a map of Ethiopia, <clears throat> what you do is you you fly into Addis Ababa, and uh, uh, you land in Addis Ababa. And then from Addis Ababa, you 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 fly to uh, one of the way. One of the options is to fly to Bahir to Baidbat, which is on Lake Tana, and visit the Blue Nile. And from there, you drive by car to uh, Gondar to see the castles of Gondar and the uh, uh, and uh, learn a little bit about the Jewish history of the of the place itself. And from Gondar. Uh, we can also go visit Simeon Mountains uh, National National Park, uh, which is absolutely stunning. You have to look it up on Google and just look at some of the images. Uh, Simeon Mountains, uh, the, 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 the area is absolutely stunning. And from Simeon Mountains, you can uh, you go back to Gondor, actually, and then you fly to Aksum, uh, unless you want to take a nice long drive. But you, you fly to Aksum, and then from Aksum to Laribela, or you could also fly from Gondor to Laribela, and eventually come back to Addis Ababa. If you're interested in seeing the southern part of Ethiopia, then you would fly into the airport at Arba Minch, which is the beginning, sort of the gateway to southern Ethiopia. And from there, you start traveling through the, uh, through the Omo Valley in this area. So this is basically what a trip to, to Ethiopia looks like. Uh, the, I've, I've experienced uh, many of the hotels in the cities. Uh, some of them are in the towns and cities. The hotels and the lodges are absolutely magnificent. Uh, in uh, the Sheraton in Addis Ababa, for example, the, uh, the hotel in uh, La Libela is absolutely beautiful. Uh, I found them to be magnificent. In other places, they're, they're adequate. Uh, so um, I really wanted to thank everybody for, for taking the time to join us today. Does anybody have any questions 
about the um, about uh, the uh, the lecture we just had about beautiful Ethiopia. You'll need to unmute yourself if there is anybody. And I'm looking at the chat. So, uh, the wheat. I think I think you did an absolutely fantastic job. It doesn't look like we have any uh, any questions here. Uh, so uh, uh, let me just uh, go here. How do I get out of here? And slideshow. Okay. Okay, so wonderful. So any, again, if anybody wants a copy of this book for your, uh, uh, for your, um, uh, your Amazon uh, Kindle or a hard copy, I can try to get you one as well. Visiting Ethiopian churches, absolutely magnificent pictures. Thank you all again for, for joining us. To those of you who are joining us from Egypt uh, today, we have uh, some of our Muslim friends. I'd like to wish you a Ramadan Karim, a very happy Ramadan holiday to you and to your families. And to everybody that's with us, uh, please uh, be safe, stay safe uh, in the United States and elsewhere around the world. And I look forward to seeing you next week. I need to think of what to do, so we'll think of something. So again, uh, Dawit, thank you very, very much for your time you. and for your information today. And uh, the lecture will be available, of course, on the YouTube channel for Scopia. So be well, everybody. Shalom, shalom. We'll see you soon. Okay. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Amisaganalam.